and welcome to the Catholic Art Institute podcast. I'm your host, Kathleen Carr. I'm the president and founder of the Catholic Art Institute. And I'm joined today by Father Silone Justiniano, um, who is our first prize winner of the Sacred Art Competition uh 2020, um, and he had many finalists uh, in in the show as well. So I'm really delighted that you're able to join us because I know how busy you are. So welcome to the program, Father. Thank you very much. I'm delighted. I'm looking forward to to having a chat about about this this uh, competition and. and uh, yeah, me too. Well, I think um, I should begin by just giving the uh, audience a little bit of information about you. So I'll just read, a, a, you know, your bio. So you're originally from Puerto Rico and you moved to the U.S. in 1985. And soon after your arrival, uh, you discovered the world of art history through a friend who introduced you to the masters of the Renaissance. Um, this engendered a, a love for drawing and painting, which eventually led you to pursue a Bachelor of Fine Arts um, at the School of Visual Arts arts in New York City. Upon completing your undergraduate work in 1995, you entered the Master of Fine Arts program at Hunter College, which uh, you completed in 1999. In 1997, you embraced orthodoxy with your family, and you're drawn to the monastic life. And in 2002, you were tonsured as a monk. In, in 2006, you were ordained to the priesthood. Um, and it was in the monastery where you learned icon painting and your egg tempera technique, which is remarkable. Um, and you are the deputy ab abbot at the monastery of St. Dionysus of Ara... Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Dionysus the Areopagite. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> on, Long, on Long Island, where you dedicate most of your time to serving the daily cycle of surfa uh, services and painting icons. Um, and your articles have appeared in various publications in the U.S. and abroad. Um, and you're the editor and contributor to the Orthodox Arts Journal, uh, which I'll put all the links to these things in the description it's below. A, I'm only one of the editors. There's other editors, so I'm, I'm you know, one of the, the, the people who who collaborate to to get the articles set up yeah so, yeah so that's that's basically a a the overview yeah yeah you know, i have to tell you something sure I, I saved this detail for this moment because i learned from your biography that you you studied at uh, the maryland institute yeah that's correct yes <laughs> and the funny thing is that uh when i decided to go to art school my first year I spent in the Maryland Institute College of Art. You're kidding. Yeah, no, wow. seriously. And then I transferred to uh, SVA. But my first encounter with college years and the struggle of, you know, trying to understand what I was doing in this life when it comes to art and everything else happened at the Maryland Institute of all places. Oh, that's so interesting, because my colleague that works on the, this organization with me also attended Maryland Institute College of Art. And um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that it's, it's going to give you all the direction that you need when you're trying to, to learn about sacred art. Well, that's the that's the, and I think that is basically part of the you know the narrative is 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 how to first of all understand what it is that you're doing as an artist, and then after you think you figure that out, then being called to something like sacred art after you haven't really been given a a foundation to to embark on something like that i mean apparently but as perhaps as we continue to talk what what appears to be a lack god god provides along the way so that's true yeah it, I, I, it, uh, having these conversations that's exactly what i've discovered how no matter the circumstances, somehow he leads us and we find what we need and, yeah, you know, exactly. and we, through the faith we become what we, we're, we're called to be. Um, but that's part of why I like this organization because we're, we're trying to instill that hope and, and get that good information to artists and patrons that, you know, because there's a philosophical problem that's happening with modernism in the modern art world as opposed to more traditional 
means and the focus is not you know in the modern art world it's more on yourself and and in our model it's giving glory to god that's what our gifts yeah. are for and when you get that right everything else falls into place. place right so yeah. um so let's begin with just a little more about uh your background um and your art training and your faith journey if you whatever you'd like to share i think would be well, you know the other funny thing is that um when I moved to the United States, I was 11 years old, and uh, the friend that uh, you mentioned that introduced me to the Masters of the Renaissance also introduced me to, to graffiti. So I was doing graffiti initially, and then through doing that, then I became acquainted with art history, and uh, in particular, my friend introduced me to Raphael, and uh, Michelangelo and of course when he was look you know he was showing me these big volumes from the high school library and I was blown over and so that triggered more interest and so um, I I just pursued it until I finally you know made it to to my first year in in, in undergrad in in uh, at the Maryland, Maryland Institute but that was a struggle because I was also having a a a struggle with what it was that I believed because I come from a former uh, Protestant background right and it was the first opportunity that I had to be on my own and so I was like, all right, now I could do anything and everything I want. But then I started realizing that that wasn't really what I needed to do. And so that then that began the faith journey. And it was simultaneous, you could say, with my journey uh, in understanding what it was that I wanted to do as a painter. Um, there was a in my first year, I had to decide towards the end of the first year if I wanted to do illustration or fine arts. And then I, I, I opted for fine arts. And um, as you alluded to, that's a completely, uh, you're on your own. Right. When uh -huh. you jump into that world, because yes, I was given some uh, basics on oil painting, but there wasn't really an emphasis on, on, on oil painting as a tradition of craftsmanship no it was mainly about honing your particular ideas and somehow conveying that in your painting but the craftsmanship itself was the secondary thing so well i think it, they, they gave us like a the Ralph Mayer, like, you know, uh, volume on, 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 on artist materials and things like, so you had to basically learn it on your own All right. besides, besides whatever was introduced in, in, in painting class, but it was minimal anyways. Yeah. So that basically, uh, continued, uh, that same principle, uh, continued throughout all undergrad. I mean, granted, I have to say that, I have to admit that there were two classes that were very important. One of them was two-dimensional design, or three classes, two-dimensional design, color, and drawing. Yeah. And, and, so, um, and so the principles of like composition, the principles of like how to put forms together and what they imply when they're coming together and things like that you know what a graphic designer would have in mind you know in when in arranging things on a page that was discussed and that was very important um and then drawing drawing the figure especially when i was at S sba i i took a few uh figure drawing classes and that i still feel it is part of me and that was a very important step yeah and then um well, and then, I think uh, I just course. want to add that, you know, because I don't yeah. want to, you know, disparage every secular art program that isn't sort of an atelier style, but there, I think yeah. you put your finger on it. There's a lot of unevenness. And in general, I have this experience and so many other people do that come from a secular art college and have to find better training. And yeah, and the drawing is everything. You need a really yeah. good drawing instructor, somebody that shows you what you're doing. And I think they do that better at, at uh, the School of Visual Arts in New York than they do. Well, you know. I think it, it, it depends on the professor. And I think that's part of the 
that's part of the uh, the problem with 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 the approach. When when you have an atelier like uh, classical drawing training, there is already an understanding of what you're going towards. Yeah, like in 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 the kind of drawing classes that you have in a, a fine arts program that is not a classical training program, you have more of an emphasis on expression, but expression that is based on the principles of like, for example, German expressionism and drawing for formal qualities, but not for specific honing of skills of like um, understanding how to develop form. Right. Yes. No, and value, you know, yes, they discuss those things, but they're, they're seen as, as secondary to what you want to do in terms of expressing yourself. That's anyhow. Exactly. So that's. But nevertheless, you get you, if you're if you're attentive, you could get some good lessons out of that. In any case, so that was part of my experience, and 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 along the way, I to tell you the truth, I I always gravitated towards expressionist kind of work, and. A work that had some content that was, for lack of a better way of putting it, some kind of spiritual content. But I didn't know how that could be communicated. See? And so that led me towards doing abstract painting. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, for example, Kandinsky's The On the Spiritual in Art, a famous book, you know, written, like, I, uh, I think it's by 1911, 1915. Right. The, the Bible of Secular Art College, everybody had to read right. that. But yeah, that, I, I looked that, into what he was into and what he was believing, and he's sitting around the table with Madame Blavatsky and all this, and it's like, yeah, oh, oh, right. here's your problem. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's exactly what the problem uh, is. I mean, it's like spirituality then is equated with like occultic kind of stuff and and um, a very nebulous internal world, a psychological inner individualistic world. Yeah. Um, there are uh, perhaps suggestions of like. Uh, nature and creation participating in God, but how that could actually be conveyed in visual form in art is left to the uh, is left up to the individual, and a lot of it, like you're alluding to, is based on occultic influence. Mm -hmm. And so, in any case. And, and, and beauty is very much not encouraged, or it's peripheral, or or it's just in the be a high of the beholder. There's sort of this aesthetic relativism that I think happens yeah. in that philosophy, yeah. where well, I say this is beautiful, even though it's scribbling. So you know, and I and right. I get to be sort of my own god in my own aesthetic world, rather than you know, I'm called to to actually aspire to something that can be revealing of God, and, and yeah. bring people to reverence, you know. And, and that's uh, I think that's where the importance of tradition comes because you you with with the when when you're part of a larger tradition that has honed specific visual forms that are communally acknowledged as uh conveying uh divine realities or expressing uh aspects of the faith in a precise way then you can navigate that and it 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 doesn't mean that you your your individuality is suppressed your individuality flourishes within the realm of the communal experience of tradition yeah and so that's where I, and that's that's what led that led me to the icon because uh, the irony is that with the problem with with modernism in spite of the problem with modernism, they were also looking at the icon, especially the Russian avant-garde. Yeah. And so, and so then that that created a bridge for me to then explore the icon. That's so and interesting. So, right. Yeah. And so, so all these, so so there is a a, a a an interesting thing that is not really discussed, especially nowadays that perhaps was more acknowledged in the beginning of the Icon Revival in France by the pioneers of the Icon Revival is 
is the connection between the icon and modernism. Because if you recall, like pe people like Picasso, like there, uh, people like Gauguin, th there was a, an exploration in early modernism on folk art, primitive art, mm -hmm. and the icon. Yeah. And because they perceived these forms as being, uh, they were not, um, they were more direct as expressive forms. Right. They were more authentic. That, yeah. And they, and they, they then also. They convey spiritual content, and they were related to the experimentations with abstraction. Yeah, you see. Yeah, and so that that was that was an area that was that was already in place when people like Ospensky in in in, in France and Contiglou in Greece, who were uh, revivalists of the icon in the early 20th century, they were partly working from within that context. And but but then they of course they they steered it towards grounding the uh, the experimentation on the tradition of the church and the communal liturgical life of the church, and steered it away from all that crazy occultism and individualism and excessive uh, you know uh, you know arbitrary expression, and so. That was what I had to shuffle through when it came to art school and my transition into eventually becoming a monk. Because as I was basically finishing up my, uh, my graduate program, that's when I was beginning to, to experiment with the possibility of becoming a monk. And so, and in the earlier, in the, in the beginning of my graduate program, that's when I became Orthodox. And so there was a, there was a parallel situation going on between my becoming Orthodox, uh, finding the monastic life as a path, and also finding, steering like my artistic inclinations towards liturgical art. So that's pretty much the complexity of that. All that. So it was all happening simultaneously. Simultaneously. Your yeah. family, your family, found themselves attracted to the Orthodox faith, or was it you that brought some of it yeah. to them? Like, how did that all? Uh... That that happened basically. That that started towards the end of my undergraduate at SBA. I was commuting from Connecticut to uh, New York, uh, and. Uh, my my dad was working at the Danbury High School where I, I was living in Danbury, Connecticut. In any case, he bumped into an Antiochian Orthodox priest and he told me about it. And I went to visit the liturgy. Okay. And at the time, of course, we were Protestant. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but the the interesting thing is that, anyways, I mean, it's, it's a bit, it, it's, it's got many layers, but sure, yeah. We were, we were reading, we were reading things from from a, a theologian, uh, the son of a theologian who had become orthodox, uh, and I, I was reading the the writings of this theologian because uh, he was a Protestant theologian because he had addressed the question of art in the twentieth century, and so interestingly. He, uh, because it's it was hard for me as as a young person being interested in in, in, in art, being Protestant. There isn't really much of a no of an interaction between fundamentalist like Protestantism and secular art world. And so, how was I going to navigate that? You know, I had mm -hmm. in, in the middle of my undergrad, I was like, I, I I came to the conclusion that I had to actually live a Christian life. I was rebelling against my upbringing initially, but then I realized, well, I have to become a true Christian. And so that led me uh, into exploring more intellectually what Protestantism had to offer in terms of its position about art. I started reading this theologian, but his son ended up converting to orthodoxy <laughs> so 
<laughs> so then my dad was like, listen, the son of such and such, a person whose books we've been reading, ends up being orthodox. Why don't you go visit this church and see what's going on? So that's how I ended up going to the liturgy at St. George Antiochian Orthodox Church in Danbury, Connecticut. And that was my first encounter with the icon within a liturgical context. Not much so of that, that started my inquiry into iconography as I was beginning my, um, my uh, graduate studies, finishing undergrad, beginning graduate studies. And when I came to New York, I became Orthodox. And so you could just imagine now Orthodox in graduate school in New York City. I, I moved to New York finally. I was commuting at first. I moved to New York. And, um, and then that started the whole struggle with, all right, now what am I going to do with my art? You know, and, and how am I going to communicate my, my yearnings for spiritual life yearnings you know to to somehow embody my faith through uh artistic form yeah and that goes into you know the next topic is like how to to bring those two things together well Anyways, it, it must have been, it must have been, <laughs> it must have been an astonishing experience to attend the traditional liturgy of coming from a Protestant background yes. or even to an, a certain extent I mean if you've ever gone to a garden variety novus ordo mass as opposed to the more traditional mass you know yeah. it's it's yeah. chalk and cheese it's two different you know yeah and I think that is exactly what what convinced me about about orthodoxy right. and in so far as i i had you could say that the 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 specific form liturgical form reached the into the depths of my heart in a way that i could not communicate intellectually at the time but it, it was such a stark difference because I would go to Bible studies in the Protestant church that I was going to. And then I would go to liturgy in the Orthodox church. And I was like, well, I feel like I'm being given something that I can't really explain. And it's nourishing me in ways beyond my comprehension. Mm. So it, it led me to inquire more. And so that eventually, so the liturgy, yes, the liturgy played a, a pivotal role in my my conversion and yeah. and, and and in my the transformation of of, of my art because yeah. then my art became liturgical art. <laughs> so well, and it shows you the power of of the traditional liturgies, but also the art because everything is working in concert together, and it's yeah. engaging all of your senses, which is you know God gave us our senses to learn and. And therefore, the mass should be that way. And, you know, those of us with gifts, it's not just for self-expression. Where is it? Where are they best contributing? It's yeah. the mass and glory of God, which happens there. That's really yeah. fascinating. Um, well, maybe you could just discuss a little bit about getting into orthodoxy and learning um, the iconography techniques. And your because you have a real master of the egg tempera, I have to say. It's so beautiful. Well, I mean, it's it's. Um, it, 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 you know, it's one of those things that you you could always continue to like you know hone the technique because the technique is as you could imagine. I I was doing oil painting first, and the kind of oil painting that you learn in in art schools nowadays, uh, it's a la prima, which is like wet on wet painting. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not. The only layering principle that they teach you is uh, what is it? Uh, fat over lean. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. but there isn't. There isn't really a a sense of structuring the image in layers. Uh, and so, anyway, so I had to read up on on um, on the egg temper technique. I looked up uh, medieval manuscripts that have been translated such as Theophilus the Presbyter. He, he wrote this uh, uh, treatise on diverse arts, it's called, like from like the, I think it's the 12th century or something like that. 
uh, he was uh, a Benedictine monk, I think German. In any case, he wrote partly on painting, then stained glass, and then uh, silversmithing. And that was my, you know, one of the first things that I that I read. And also, uh, Chanino Chanini, who was the disciple of a master who was connected to Giotto, and so that that's like he did a he did a, a treatise called um, El Libro del Arte uh, on on panel painting. And um, and this was translated by uh, Daniel V. Thompson, and he he uh, Thompson taught at I think Harvard, and and he experimented uh, based on this treatise. He tried to like basically apply it to contemporary materials and how you could actually use the technique. And so I I read uh, Thompson's uh, works on egg tempera um, based on Shanini's books uh, a book manuscript and um, then more contemporary uh, uh, painters who were basing their work on Daniel Thompson but updating some of the measurements and like some of the the technical uh, peculiarities because part of the problem with as you I, I'm sure you know it's like reading a treatise on painting is is always a conundrum because they use materials that we don't have anymore and you know or measurements that are strange and like the way they're putting things together you're like what the heck are they talking about right, so, yeah anyway so it took a while to get acclimated with that stuff and um and so i basically devised a technique based primarily on shanino shanini which is uh the kind of technique that the masters from the late 14th early 15th century would have used which is you have an under drawing an ink drawing and uh, uh, and then as the structure the drawing structure and then you uh, do local colors and then you highlight or or darken the local color of each area okay yeah that's the basic principle behind it and so the thing the thing is that you could give the egg tempera is you're using egg yolk and dry pigments mineral pigments you know and and uh you do a one-to-one -one egg yolk and pigment and you could use it as as thickly or as thinly you could water it down with water as thinly as you want and so you have a whole ra range of opacity and transparency and so you're working with uh drawing structure local color building form based on those local colors with light and dark and opacity and transparency that's the basic principles behind egg tempera and so in the in the icon painting technique what we do is that we start dark and then we lighten the color mm -hmm. and that brings out the form right and there is an emphasis on the two-dimensionality of the picture plane and so there isn't really much emphasis on the depth and so you're basically bringing out the form from the you know from from the picture plane and uh and based on those those parameters then that's what I used to bring about the conceptualizing of those compositions, basically. Yeah. But based on the on initially on the research with the medieval manuscripts, and then updating it to what we could do now uh, with the materials that we have, which is pretty lines up pretty well, and um, um, and then personalizing it, you know. And the thing is that there is no. Uh, there are different schools of icon painting in terms of how they approach egg tempera. Although there is a tendency of thinking of the icon painting tradition as so so canonically based that people tend to think that there is only one way of doing it. Yeah. And so and so there is there is enough room 
for flexibility when it comes to that. Well, that's what I saw in what you had done, because obviously, you know, you're following the proper traditions, but your, your, you know, your hand is there, as they say. You know, everybody's got, in that it was the beautiful sensitivity to describing those forms within the tradition. The attention to detail, you know, it's just beautifully crafted is really what I was seeing. And, and I, you know, because I understand the challenges of working with egg tempera. And sometimes you see too many highlights and icons or they're yeah. very, very chalky looking. And, and yours, you know, were just beautifully done. I mean, I remember just the hand in St. Innocent of Alaska and so beautifully described, you know. I think, I think the important thing that uh, needs to be emphasized is the um, there is a tendency to think that icon painting since it is a stylized form of, of like com, com, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a painting convention it's like a, a, a tradition that has a specific conventional approach and that it is it is not it is not naturalistic the tendency is to think that therefore you could get away with uh painting a, an approach to painting that undermines integrity of form clarity of of line clarity of like the the development of values you know and so the abs so so then the, the abstraction becomes sort of like a a an excuse for lack of command of craftsmanship and an and artistic you know yeah i agree i agree, I agree. You know, and so and so that's that's one of the things that i, I find disconcerting sometimes because part of the there it is good that there is an icon revival but part of the revival also entails there is a lot of misconception and a lot of people want they they think that it all it all boils down to taking a one week workshop and that's all you need to do to to, to paint an icon you know and so and that's the that's the um, that's the danger of, 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 of the current revival yeah and I think I think uh, you know I think one of the things that I think needs to be emphasized is that just like you need command of your art when it comes to naturalistic painting you need command of your art when it comes to icon painting yeah they're different they're different conventions but they equally they, they 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 require mastery and you have to invest your whole life into honing those skills yeah. it's not going to happen overnight that's right you know? that's the same with you know any kind of thing of beauty you're trying to create you really you know you've got to put the work in many years of honing your craft and drawing and then on top of that you know because if you're going from drawing to painting you're essentially drawing with your paints you have to understand the form and and, that. Yeah. and I agree and I don't want to discourage anybody that wants to take a workshop no. and find you know and finds it edifying I think that there's a real beautiful thing that happens you know with the fasting and praying preparing yourself yeah. before you know the icon work but it is notable and I'm glad you brought that up that you know, because I think it's also a problem that you have in art college that it that it's inborn only. You just fall out of the sky and you're yes. Michelangelo or not. And and that's not true of any other discipline, you know. You gotta don't you think, you know, Pele and Ronaldo had to train with a good person to become the, you know, great soccer players they were. The same with writers, the same with yeah. dancers, you know, musicians. Yeah. Well, in art college, just, you know, go to the store, buy your paints and get yourself and get going. And there's never a connection there to, but has, hang on a second. I'm looking at this beautiful, you know, old master painting, you know, and it's the layering. It's the years of drawing. Yes. I didn't take a one or two, you know, I got my, my undergraduate credits fulfilled. So now I'm a master of drawing. No, it's uh, not. That's true, and and I think that is, uh, um, I think uh, you have to incorporate it, and this is, I think, 
you know, we 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 talk about uh, when it comes to the spiritual life, like asceticism, like the discipline that you have to put into it in prayer, like you were saying, the fasting. Uh, you know the regiment of like making sure that you're making it to the liturgy you know partaking of the Eucharist so on and so forth all these things as part of the uh, ascetic practical life that that opens up the possibility the possibility makes you fertile for for the grace of God to work in your life and so um, similarly with when it comes to 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 uh, sacred art, you have to put into it a lot of work. It, you have to be ascetical about it. I mean, and, and and that's not. I'm not talking about beating yourself with a stick or anything like that. I'm talking about just, you know, if 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 you need to practice like a piano player, he he or she practices for an hour or two or three, you know, every morning, you know. At, at, you know, so whatever. You, if if you need to hone your drawing skills, you need to practice one or two hours of drawing in the morning. You know, and so, and and then you begin to realize that then uh, you're dealing with uh, your 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 vocation as a as a painter uh, being incorporated into your the overall your overall life. Uh, but also into your spiritual life, they're they're intertwined. You cannot separate the two, and they they you know they mutually enrich and inform each other. And that's so, that's well put. Well, I think we should move on to to um, talking directly about the things that that you created and placed in the in the art prize. Um, and I can read the comments from the juror uh, for your first prize, Saint Innocent of Alaska. Um, which, you know, is, is so beautifully done. Uh, so um, Dennis McNamara says that this was chosen for its evidence of mastery of the art of iconography and its fulfillment of the selection criteria. Um, a saint is chosen who is at once human and divinized with a face revealing the human passions transformed by grace. As this expression shows the pathos proper to a missionary subject, um, subject to hardship, yet also subdued intellectual vitality of one contemplating the face of God, suitable to his role as first resident Orthodox Bishop of Alaska. The complexity of the secondary and tertiary images are masterfully composed and read in proper visual hierarchy. The elaboration of the vestments, which contain, in effect, four smaller icons within the depictions of historical scenes in the Alaska landscape, which speak of his role as an evangelizer and translator of scriptures into local languages. The scroll signifying his authority as a scholar and bishop, which adds vitality by extending outside the frame of the image itself. Um, so I don't know if you want to elaborate, but I think that that captures an awful lot of, you know, why this w became first prize. It's all of those yeah. things. The, uh, uh, I think it's, it, it, it would be good to put it in, in context. This icon was actually done for a, um, an iconostasis, which is the icon screen separating the nave of the church from the altar in an Orthodox church. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, it, it was for a chapel um, uh, in upstate New York, uh, named after Saint Innocent. Now, the the person who ordered the icon um, wanted to have uh, a, an icon of the Mother of God uh, painted to go as part of the you know the whole scheme, the whole design. And that icon, the prototype that he wanted, it had a red halo. It's a medieval uh, Russian icon. And so the idea came to me, all right, a way of combining all the icons together, I could give them a red halo. Hence the red halo of St. Innocent, which also you know, symbolically has to do with his fiery love for God. And, uh, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so the unique thing about this icon was that the priest who wanted it did not want St. Innocent as a bishop. 
which is the usual way that he is depicted. Because eventually he became uh, bishop, archbishop, and metropolitan of Moscow and all Russia, right? So he said, I want him depicted as a missionary in his younger years as a priest. And so, so then I had to, all right, how am I going to do that? I mean, that requires interpretation. You know, I, I, I can't rely on the usual icons. So I had to look at multiple icons of St. Innocent and then glean from them all how he would have looked in younger years and then you know uh, elaborate this new prototype uh, from from within the choir of all the various examples and um another interesting thing about this icon is the eagle that he has yeah that is actually a detail from his life um it is told in his life that he um encountered a, a an eagle that was sick and he nursed the eagle back to life and he tried to release the eagle back uh, to nature but the eagle would not go away That's and so the eagle finally flew away and then he circled around and came back to Saint Innocent and prostrated itself or bowed to Saint Innocent and then flew away and so I thought to myself, well, that's a perfect symbol of like, you know, of St. Innocent as an equal to the apostles, bringing the gospel to the, you know, to yeah, North America. It's really clever. And, and so, you know, and of course, the, the bald eagle is a symbol of, 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 of America. So it's, it, be, it became a, a perfect, you know, uh, uh, solution to, 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 to emphasizing his pivotal role as a missionary in, in, in you know, in North America. So, um, yeah, I don't know what else to say, but, uh, oh, another interesting detail is when you look at his uh, stole, you will find that it has depicted in it St. Peter and Paul, and at the bottom it has St. Cyril and Methodius. You can't really make out the, the saint uh, behind the eagle, but the implication is, if you read St. Cyril, and then you would have to say Methodius, who are the, the missionaries of the Slavs. Right. And so it's another way of emphasizing his role as equal to the apostles in North America. So. Yeah, wow. Well, I'm glad you shared all of that, because it, it just shows the thoughtfulness, layering, storytelling, craftsmanship. Your sharing is beautiful. I love the... Um, you know the scenes in the, of his life happening in the background um, right. just you know it's re really beautiful how long did it take you to do this i think that took like approximately like uh three three to four months well yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so the um the other thing that i would have to say about this icon like thinking about uh what uh dr uh magnamara has has pointed out is uh, and this goes back to what we were discussing in terms of form. Um, one of the unique things about this icon, I think, is that although stylized, as you would expect from uh, the tradition of icon painting, there is a sense of depth in it. Right. Mm -hmm. You do really get... you Because, for example, you enter, you enter that... that composition via for example the scroll that extends out from the from the frame from the bordering frame right mm -hmm. and and also the eagle so these have like you could almost say that they have like a three-dimensional kind of depth that like you encounter and then you then go and in, you 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 encounter the saint and then you get you go beyond him in the background. So there is this gradual entering into the image where you do, although it's not exaggerated, you do get a sense of as if you're looking through a window. And that's something that is usually not, not uh, emphasized or seen as part of what an icon would do. And I think that's what gives gives this icon an, a, a 
a dimension that is that is also unique in terms of, of, of form. Yeah, I agree, and I think it's a and I think it's a good thing because uh, you know it's where you're taking a tradition and you're adding your own hand, and it shows you that this can be brought forward today, still very edifying and and done, but slightly set apart and and unique in its you know execution and approach. Um, I love it. I, you know, and it's, and it's good that it's not, you know, this is the thing about iconography and I can see why that was a jumping off point for the early Renaissance. You know, you're still, there's something that is mystical about this style that brings you into prayer where if it's too academically painted photorealistic you start to lose it it starts to pedestrianize something that should be you know holy and mystical so you know yeah and that's uh and that's a hard that's a hard balance to maintain and i think um uh the discussions that that uh that uh you've had with uh dr magnamara like about this problem the way he's put it i think is important because there is he, he emphasizes the the uh reverence towards the material world and also a the transfiguring of the material mm -hmm. it, you know as as it participates uh with the divine that's right and that's, that's the challenge it's like how are we to convey something like that? And of course, the model for iconographers is the Lord's Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. and, and hence why it is commonly said that an icon is supposed to depict things in a transfigured way, you know? Uh, but that doesn't mean that like you uh, over abstract the image and deprive it of, 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 of vitality and, and life. Yeah. One of the things that is important to emphasize is that in the medieval period, the Byzantines looked at the icons, uh, they, they considered their icons to be uh, living images, mm -hmm. lifelike images. They didn't think of them as being abstract representations. They thought of them as being very true to life. And they, in, in, you know, they perceived them and interacted with them um, as, as, you know, conveying the presence of, 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 of the people and, uh, and the events depicted. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind because... Um, like you alluded to, uh, there there is a in the Paleologian period, in the late stages of the Byzantine Empire, you have a re-exploration of the classical kind of painting, um, and um, a realism and a humanizing of of the figure becomes uh, important, and that becomes sort of like a transitional moment from the Byzantine to the early periods of the Renaissance. And of course, eventually things get like excessively naturalistic, but I think that 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 balance that occurs uh, in the late stages of the Byzantine Empire, I think is is worth exploring and looking into as as you know, valuing the the the, the classical sense of, of, of the figure but also with a transcendental, a transcendental or a transfiguring kind of like uh, nuancing of it. Yeah, that's that's right, and it's exactly you know that that is a fine balance, and it's just something that we're trying to draw more attention to as we see, because then you know when. We're, we're depicting people that are in heaven there, you know, and, and the church art art is a depiction of heaven. But these are saintly people that are in the, you know, partaking in the divine life. They're no longer down here. So they there's got to be some means of communicating that where it's not just like a painting of a portrait of somebody dressed in, you know, clothing from the time period of Christ, painted in a very photorealistic and academic way. Something is lost. And yes. I feel like so often I'm looking at, a you know, somebody that's cast a film and they've put the wrong people in the roles or something. Like, I just, I'm right. not believing this at all. Like, yeah, you know? because it becomes, it becomes just a continuity with our everyday yeah uh, uh, temporal life and uh, the challenge is to actually imply through the image something that is um, otherworldly exactly and and you know and and the thing is you know there is usually when it comes to icon painting there's certain devices that are emphasized as 
helping to accomplish that. But I would say that although that 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 is true, uh, we have to also remember that it's how you use the devices. It's not just the devices themselves. Mm -hmm. You see, yeah. and we have to also be careful with making generalizations about icons and losing sight of the specific aesthetic form of each specific icon we're dealing with. Yeah. Because there is there is a general expectation of what an icon should do or any sacred art should do. And there is what that specific work does. And so even if the even if the icon is working from within the traditional framework, that icon might not be actually doing what an icon should be doing. And that's that has to be kept in mind like getting back to what we were saying before it's like or you know another parallel is like people who can't paint landscapes they want to do impressionism because they could hide behind the brush strokes <laughs> you know what i'm saying yes, yeah. so similarly it's like the same problem with icon painting you know it's like well yes it's supposed to be a transfigured uh, reality that we're conveying but you you're not actually giving me that in the way you that you've used the tradition so that's that's one thing that i would i think uh try to like um emphasize more and that needs to be brought up in the discussions because uh because otherwise then then we're not really looking at at the work in front of us yeah and 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 some spiritual is constituted in the aesthetic form yeah and, you know, and a lack of technique or other things can get in the way of what you yes, do that's yes. what i think you know that's it's really yeah. smart and you know so, uh, this is such a great conversation and really really think this is going to be helpful and enjoyable for people um because i love what you've done i love that you have been very thoughtful and prayerful and using the the tradition but making it you know transforming it or it's your own hand or, you know everything we've discussed so we can um i'm i just pulled up your um your honorable mention of saint mamas of uh Kesa, Kesa? sorry caesarea caesarea, caesarea in Cappadocia. okay okay duh i should know that sorry no, i'm sorry <laughs> you to tell me how to pronounce it before I got on. I'm sorry. That's right. That's, that's part and parcel of this, you know, uh, weird names are always popping up in the Orthodox world, so not to worry. Yeah, right. I know. But this is beautifully composed. I, the attention to detail, the color, the composition, I love the, the mane of the of the lion. So, yeah. I don't know, whatever you'd like to share. This, this, this is an interesting icon because uh, there, it is based on an icon in Cyprus, if I'm not mistaken, because St. Mamas is venerated in, in all the Orthodox world. He is most venerated in, in Cyprus. I think there is a monastery in Morfu who is, that is known as like the center of the veneration of like uh, St. Mamas. Uh, he, he was an early martyr from like the third century, a uh, great martyr. Um, uh, he, you know, he, he, uh, I, I mean, we could go into details, but as, as you could tell from the icon, um, he spent time uh, living in the wilderness, and um, uh, in, and and so wild beasts gathered around him, and he befriended the wild beasts. And um, when it came time for him to be arrested, uh, the soldiers came. He he gave them uh, milk. Uh, because he used to also uh, help the poor by by making cheese from the milk of, of goats and and and, and uh, deer, um, and so and hence the little lamb that he holds. But there is a, there is an interesting uh, account um, related to a tradition from Cyprus. In Cyprus, there is a tradition that uh, has Saint Mamas live in a as a hermit outside the skirts of Morfu and so um, he is denounced because he's not paying taxes so he is arrested and he's taken to town and on his way to town 
he encounters a lion trying to devour a lamb and he subdues the, the, the lion defends the lamb and he rides the lion to town <laughs> and he, because of his bravery then he's exempted from taxes and he's left alone wow so my 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 theory is that there must have been a a hermit named mamas in the outskirts of morfu and so the life of uh, this hermit and uh the early uh early uh, great martyr became conflated in this in this account but in the life of the great martyr you also find for example uh lions and uh the uh, and 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 of course uh the the deer or lambs and things like that so so it, both in terms of iconography uh uh iconology they 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 relate in any case one of the things that i tried to do with the lion for example is introduce into the way that i treated the drawing aspects of indian and japanese and chinese uh, representations of uh, lions, uh, hence the orientalizing, uh, you know, uh, style of 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 the lion, um, and so that was the reason why I did that is because in the uh, versions that I had in Connor of Saint Mamas, I didn't quite like the demeanor of the lion. I wanted a lion that seem more fierce and so and this gave me the opportunity to you know experiment with with some uh <laughs> stylization there coming right. from engine art <laughs> but, but it works great you've you've accomplished that and and it's really just all the detail is, is mesmerizing i, I love it i so so inspired I, I this is you've been so thoughtful about the way that you've approached these um you know these different icons i the symbolism and everything. It's really, I'm so delighted to have you on to share this. Um, so you had two other pieces that were selected. Um, yeah, yeah. Now go on and, sub I'm never going to get this one. Saint, it begins with an O-N. Ah, uh, Saint Onufrius the Great. Yes. Yes, the hermit, like, uh, in the wilderness. Yeah, hmm. yeah. And there is, like, the seraph, seraph uh, giving him communion. So, Saint uh, Onufius the Great was from, uh, I believe, the 5th century. Let me see. Uh, Saint Onufius, actually, he was from the 4th century. Like, uh, he lived in the Thebaid uh, desert in Egypt. He uh, was discovered by Saint Pavnutius. And um, uh, he spent his life uh, completely secluded. And... Um, St. Pavnutius asked him, how do you manage in terms of like, you know, food and, 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 and especially uh, the Eucharist? How do you, I mean, how do you deal with... And uh, St. Anufius said that every Saturday and Sunday, an angel of the Lord would appear to him to impart to him the Eucharist. And so uh, I decided, okay, let me depict that moment. And in um, Orthodox iconography, you will not find this specific scene. You do find it in Western early Renaissance, especially Northern Northern uh, uh, Renaissance uh, paintings. But uh, I decided to, instead of doing a regular angel, to do something more mystical, do a seraph. And of course, Seraph is the highest rank of the angels, closest to God, and they're uh, they're fiery or burning ones, you know. And, and this uh, is the biblical description and, of them. I've seen, you know, that they have many yeah. eyes and sit the wing. Yes, and so to me that was like sort of because one of the things that you hear often in the hymnography uh, about the desert saints, hermits, and monastics is. Uh, uh, they 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 had they used the phrase for example that goes uh, a desert dweller an angel in the flesh you see and so and monasticism is often referred to as the angelic life and so um, and so to have of course like this this amazing like otherworldly image of a seraph 
next to this like wild man you know living in the desert i thought that was like they were like they're mutually crazy looking you know what i mean <laughs> and so so they're like brethren you know they're living in in the divine life you know together yes. so um and so the angel becomes in a way a representation of the longing and burning for god of the saint and uh the date palm tree we're told in the life of saint anufius would produce enough dates for him to survive throughout the year with food and there was also a spring uh next to his his dwelling his cave uh that provided him with water and so he had everything he, the desert became a paradise hence you know at the bottom you see a little bit of like flowers mm -hmm. and then you have like a green sky which is based uh, on indian miniature painting uh especially the mughal painters there was a tendency of using malachite for backgrounds and i, I decided i'm going to use malachite for this background and of course green is uh symbolic of uh the grace of the holy spirit and so all these factors come together to make this uh otherworldly image of of saint Anubis. yes Angel in the flesh. Well, it's beautifully, beautifully done. And I love the compressed palette and the description. And it's still stylized, but you like you described that form and all the symbolism. Oh, very good. That one also has uh, some some uh, depth in it. As you notice, like at the bottom, he appears as if like he's about to walk into your own right. space. Yeah. You know, it's, it's now, the, the diagonal angle hmm. helps to convey that and the fact that he's actually stepping beyond the border. Yeah, it's, it, you've, you've been very good and subtle with adding these things. So it does, you know, it's still flat and it's still stylized, but there is that, you know, appropriate sense of depth that makes this just visually interesting and just really beautifully executed. So um, the last one is St. Mary of Egypt and St. Zosimus. That's right. That's right. Uh, St. Mary of Egypt is, I think, perhaps more known. Um, she uh, She's an interesting saint. She lived in the 6th century um, from very early in her life. I think she might have been 11 or 12. She left her family and lived on her own and basically lived a life, uh, uh, life of uh, prostitution. And... Um, and, um, and a in a, a moment in her life she bumped into a group of people who were on their way to jerusalem and so she decided she would go along with them and uh they were going to the commemoration of the uh uh the cross uh the feast of the uh exaltation of the cross if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. and um um uh, when she got to jerusalem she tried to enter into uh the holy sepulcher but she could not she encountered this presence that like she could not uh, you know press press into the nave and then she began to realize the reason why i cannot enter and behold the life-giving cross is because of my impurity and she began to repent and there was a um on the threshold um uh an image of the mother of god and so she asked the mother of God, mother of God, please give me an opportunity to behold the life giving cross and I will do anything and everything that you want me to do. And uh, the mother of God revealed to her, you know, uh, that, she, you know, to, to go to the desert beyond the Jordan for a life of repentance. She was granted the blessing to go and venerate the cross. And then afterwards, she spent 47 years living in the desert on her own. And so, um, towards the end of her life, Saint uh, Sosimas, he was a great ascetic. He was, uh, conversely, from very early in his life, a monastic, and spent his whole life in asceticism. And he got to the point where he was thinking that he was perhaps like one of the greatest, like, you know, most virtuous monks that could be because he had accomplished all the feats of, you know, self-control and so on and so forth. And an angel of the Lord revealed to him, well, you have to, you know, get a reality check. So we're going to send you to 
to Jerusalem and you're going to encounter something there that will actually give you some insight as to your virtue. And so he is led uh, through the grace of God to the desert and he encounters uh, St. Mary of Egypt and uh, she is, um, she, she tells him her life and um, she requests from him to come the next year with uh, the Eucharist. And so he does. And that scene that the icon depicts is the moment uh, where she is uh, on the other side of the Jordan. And whereas, you know, uh, St. Sosimus is in the opposite side. And he's like, how am I going to get the holy gifts to, 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 to this ascetic? And she makes the sign of the cross and she starts to walk on the waters of the Jordan. And so this icon is that moment where she's walking on the waters and she is receiving the Holy Eucharist from St. Sosimus. And then eventually he uh, ends up bearing her. Um, and, but the important thing about this icon and the icon of St. Onufrius is that these are two hermits, but they never... They, they emphasize the importance of the Eucharist, even for those who are living in the wilderness. They, they, they become a, a refutation of a, a heresy. This is the Messalian heresy, which is the notion that you could uh, rely solely on your own devotional prayer to acquire theosis or deification or union with right. God. And so... Uh, through their life, the church emphasizes, no, we acquire union with God, not only through our own effort, but through participation in the liturgical life of the church, in particular, and prime, and prime most example, of course, and the cent central uh, uh, means is, is the Eucharist. And so that's the connection between those two images. But, you know, and last thing. This is an interesting image also in terms of the way that the landscape is done. Because normally in a, an icon, the landscape is such that uh, the mountains are larger and they tend to crop the background, meaning that the sky would be sort of like reduced uh -huh. in importance. This, on the other hand, you have a uh, the sky predominating the background, and then the, the the landscape mountain ridge at the very bottom. And so, what that uh, that gave me the opportunity to basically create a gradation from like a a an ochreish color mm -hmm. at the bottom to the blue at the top, and it has a sense of depth but it's kept just in check where it doesn't become too exaggerated right but it it gives the image an atmosphere and at the bottom in particular you do get a sense of like that kind of like sandy kind of dusty yeah kind of atmosphere you do that's, so. that's true yeah really uh, thanks for it's good to you've pointed all of these things out i don't know that they would always be so you know, readily understood by people. I, and I love how, you know, the story that the Eucharist is the center and there you have it, the two coming together and there's the Eucharist in the center showing their story and the importance of it. Really, um, really clever. You've really thought so much about these and it's great to go through them here. Um, so I'm delighted. Thanks again for coming and sharing so much. My pleasure, my pleasure. Well, I think, um, I think that that's pretty much covering it. I don't know if you have any advice for aspiring artists or iconographers or... or um... I think uh, a reiteration of what was said before. Yeah. I think, I think um, making sure that... And this is not, of course, to discourage... There, not everybody has the vocation to be an iconographer. Right. right? So if somebody wants to, you know take a week 
workshop just for the sake of the spiritual edification that we'll find from a workshop in iconography, by all means, do. That's There's no problem with that. Right. Uh, but if you want to embark on actually like dedicating your life to icon painting, treat it like you know, like what it is, a vocation, which means incorporating into it, incorporating it into your life, in particular your your spiritual life. You should have a spiritual uh, discipline that you're maintaining. You should be in constant interaction with the liturgical life of the church mm -hmm. and you should be always constantly honing your skills as a painter and uh because icon painting is is is, is an art form it, it is it is not just an art form because it's a liturgical art and therefore it's got a great mission that you know is a tool for something uh, uh great uh, but but it also involves the the mastering of specific techniques, specific you know uh, uh, aspects of of, 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 of of visual art, uh, and so drawing in particular, color, form, all these things should be studied constantly, um, and as. A musician would would uh, study his notes and do, you know, scales mm -hmm. just to warm up. Drawing should be part of of, 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 of the whole of the whole uh, discipline, and um, and also do not disregard looking at multiplicity, uh, it like uh, different kinds of of, of painting. Mm -hmm. Whether it is, whether it is the works of the masters of the renaissance whether it is the masters of the medieval period whether it is western or a oriental art uh, you know because there are parallels in the uh, icon painting tradition with the sacred art of other cultures and so that should be explored as um food for thought and ways of 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 actually sparkling ideas mm -hmm. Uh, sparking ideas and 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 so that way the the development of the tradition continues and it's not just a stagnant it's not just seen as a stagnant form but it is something like tradition implies something that continues and it is always living right. and that is always enriched by our contribution um that arises from our participation in christ yeah i that's really well said and i think that's a good place to that we can sign off and end here. But uh, thanks so much again for being on. This is really and Thank really you for great. giving me the opportunity and thank you for putting putting this together in the first place. And Because I, I think one of the things we need more and more is uh, the promotion of sacred art. Yeah. Uh, that's something that, that uh, is, not, is not done very often and then I'm glad that is beginning to, to pick up. Um, but um, now I think with uh, the connections that we have through social media, then there is uh, a different kind of platform that perhaps could um, uh, facilitate right. the the and, you know and the the encouraging of of, of, of that facet of, of yeah culture. I totally agree. We need community. We need we need support one another and you're right this is why i wanted to do this competition i want to do more of them i want to have more shows you know sponsorship helps us so that we can give away prize money because it's people i don't think realize that you know it is such a challenge to be called to this and you know sometimes the patronage isn't there and we're trying to connect all of these dots put the good information yeah. out there you know educate the patrons uh, get more patronage support the artists especially in offering their gifts yeah. so thanks so much um yeah thank you very much God really and, cool. uh, we'll keep going on but continue your hard work and uh, and uh, it's already bearing good fruit so i'm sure it will continue so god bless you. you too thanks again and congratulations until next time thank you. all right bye-bye bye-bye